especially to my fellow Earthers around the globe. Um, so far, we have seen three episodes from Winona Earp Season 4. And um, so, I'm so excited uh, for the upcoming episodes. Uh, I think the story is great. Uh, and then last episode was directed by Melanie Scorfano. I'm so proud of her. She did a great job. I know most of us are living outside the U.S. and Canada and we are trying, especially me, this channel is really trying hard to help uh, promote the show. Um, you can actually uh, watch the replays on Sci-Fi's app on uh, App Store or Play Store but I'm not sure if it's really available on other countries but please do try check it out and download the, uh, the app. Um, here is a video of Kat's interview uh, via Geek Hard. Uh, I'm not sure when was this interview done but I think it's just a recent interview from her. So, hope you guys uh, enjoy it. Again, I am so thankful for everyone's support on the Pride Diaries. Do uh, click the subscribe button for more updates on Wine on Herb, uh, Way Hot, and Dom Cat. So, ciao for now. Take care. Bye. So welcome to the program, Catherine Barrel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's fun to be here. Yeah, well, uh, very excited. Of course, it's been a long journey for Winona Earp season four to finally begin premiering. We're just days away, but you guys are already back shooting the, uh, the second half of season four. And I just wanted to touch base on that because you guys are like the first big production to be shooting in the COVID world. What's that like? Oh, it's pretty crazy. Um, it's so funny. It's so... It's so fitting for Winona Earp because, of course, this would happen. Uh, like, it's just, I feel like we have this joke that it feels like we've been trying to shoot season four for like 12 years. Um, but um, it's really an amazing experience just to see how much effort and how much work has been put in by the producers and the writers to accommodate for new roles. Um, but just by the whole team, the whole crew, like everyone's sort of relearning how to do things because we can't do things. It's very hard to socially distance on a film set. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, there's a cold that always goes around every season. And, you know, so it's, um, it's a whole new way of working. And I think it just shows how dedicated the crew and the cast and everyone involved with the production are to telling the story because um, everyone's just going above and beyond to, to do the best work they can with this completely kind of new set of guidelines. And it's, it's amazing to see, you know, I've always said the film industry were a pretty hardy, resilient industry, and this is definitely no exception to that, but uh, we're getting it done. Wow. Well, that, no, that's, that's exciting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about it. I'm like, wow, you guys are like the, yeah, the, like probably the first show that's getting out there that's uh, actually shooting in this thing because everybody up in, yeah, uh, in California think, not doing anything right now. So. I think they, like, I haven't looked at the, uh, at any numbers or anything, but I know there's like a couple movie of the week shooting, but I haven't heard of any like um, longer term production starting up. So I think we may be one of the first, which is, which is great. And you know, we're, uh, it's a uh, very, very apropos for Wine on Earth. That's for sure. <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> yeah because like you guys it's been a long road to season four as i said of course there was the uh, situation with the budget and mm -hmm. of course the uh the erpers came out in force the fight for winona campaign a nice year-long struggle uh -huh. finally came yeah. to happen you guys started to shoot again back in february and mm -hmm. uh i know that uh this was um Melly scrifano's directorial debut on one of the episodes so yeah. what was it like working with her as a director this time? Oh, it was amazing. She did such an incredible job and just, I think, blew everybody away. We, we knew she was going to be amazing, but, like, to see her in action, especially jumping between, I think on some days we had, like, three Winonas because we'd have a photo double for Melanie, a stunt double for Melanie, and then the real Melanie. 
um, and she'd be jumping between like it's one thing to direct something but it's a whole other kettle of fish when you're like also the lead of the show and so you're also in everything and I just think she she just handled it so well and she um she she was just on her game I never saw her sort of get into her head or start to get anxious or like she just kept her head about her and made amazing decisions she was totally there for us as actors and that was a, uh, episode three that she directed is a really um it's an interesting episode for my character nicole because she's sort of in an emotional place we've never seen her in so i was really um concerned with how to pitch it like just tonally how to come across and it was actually the first episode that we shot coming back because we shot episodes three and four before episodes one and two and um, I think just so Melanie could go the two weeks earlier and do the proper pre-production that all the directors do because while we're shooting there's another whole other team prepping so um so it was like I really remember really leaning heavily on her as a director just to like try and remember what Nicole was and then try and figure out what this new version of Nicole was so it was really incredible process um but she did an amazing job yeah we're, we're so proud of her I gotta say yeah it'd be kind of funny to uh be trying to refine your character while there's multiple Winonas running around to set. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, for her, I don't know how she jumped in and out and like, you know, just arranging. It's, it's such a challenge. It's, it's one thing to direct. It's a whole other thing to do it while you're also playing, you know, Winona Earth. Right, of course. Yeah. When you're the main focus like that, yeah. definitely. Now, uh, the, uh, the series kicks off, of course, this season kicks off with a lot of action, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, of course, you know, big, uh, big fallout from the things that happened at the end of season three. But one thing that I felt was kind of a theme, at least in the first two episodes, is this relationship between Nicole and Winona kind of becoming the, be the, the best frenemies sort of thing that's been throughout the story. It really is like the main focus of both Nicole and Winona storylines right at the beginning of the season. What was it like to further, you know, explore that dynamic? Oh, it was so wonderful. I, I love the kind of good cop, bad cop dynamic with Winona and Nicole, or like the Thelma and Louise, the, the buddy cop feel that these characters have. They're just like the two personality types are such perfect opposition that it's just a brilliant um, vehicle for these comedic moments but also like so much heart which I really love because we've had a lot of fun exploring um, you know Winona and Nicole and the kind of chaos that they get into which I really love but I found in these episodes we really got to explore a lot of the heart and a lot of the genuine love between these characters and um, I loved doing the, the episode where um, I believe it's it's one it's episode one where we are in the, um, we're outside of the portal. And Winona's about to fly through the portal and Nicole's just crashed through the ceiling and she's broken in, in a million places. And Rachel Valdez is there. We've just met Rachel. And we shot that whole scene. That scene was like, I wanna say 16 pages. Cause it's a really long sequence, but it's broken up cutting to the other, like Doc and Waverly and what they're doing. And, um, but we shot it just because of, it was such a demanding day and we had to get it all in one day. We ended up shooting, like block shooting it. So we'd put the camera one way, we'd shoot the, the whole, all the pages on one side and then we'd flip the whole room and we'd shoot everything. So it was like doing a play. Yeah, yeah, that's so what like, I was thinking. We like rolled the camera and then we were like in a play. Um, and it was amazing because usually in, in, when you're working on film, it's like every two minutes, they're like, cut, and you're like, oh, okay, I just got my, my groove on here. Yeah, yeah. So um, that scene in particular, there was so much emotion wrapped into that scene. The stakes were so high. It was another thing where, you know, you see these two characters like kind of maybe saying goodbye, but neither wanting to admit it. It's that that stake, those, those stakes are just so incredibly high and the love that they have to take care of this young girl and just the, it, it was so clear in those moments when they're like holding on to each other and and Nicole has this line she says to Winona it has to be you you're the heir it has to be you it always mm -hmm. was going to be you and I think it was just such a beautiful moment and I I'm so excited to see how it turns out 
Um, but I just remember really feeling like, and, and the stuff that they do in the, um, when Rachel's shooting at them, like that's where we sort of get that funny buddy cop yeah. um, vibe from them. There's just so much. And their first reunion, like it's all just coming back to me now, their first reunion when, you know, Nicole comes and just smokes who I know across. There's so many beautiful, fun, but also like really touching moments in that episode in the first two. Um, that I'm just so, I'm so excited to watch it. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, no, that's the thing. Like, I like the, the, the fact that the two characters, you know, uh, there's this, always this tension, even when they do care about each other, there is almost like a, an undercurrent of violence, like the punch and things like that. Is that, yes. they're, it's almost like they know in the back of their head, it's like, well, the other person's a warrior, they can take this. So if I'm pissed Literally. at you, I'm going to fucking punch you. Oh, so. I'm going to give it to you. You glorious ginger bitch. <laughs> give me a big one. Uh, of course, aside from being an actor, you are also a writer, a director, a producer. You've worked yeah. on numerous projects uh, that I've gotten a chance to check out. And oh, uh, nice. yeah, you. and so I want to talk a little bit about the, a couple of these shorts that I know you're trying to, they're proof of concept for like TV series yeah. ideas and stuff. What is, like, you obviously have an interest in the, multiple facets of personality and the mind. Yeah. Uh, do you, is that something you really want to continue to explore in your work? It, it is something I really, I'm really fascinated with like, just like how complex we are on the inside. I'm really, I, you know, I, I speak openly about mental health and how I think it's so important to talk about our mental health and our struggles and this idea that we've got constantly these conflicting kind of, voices in our heads about what we should do, what we shouldn't do, how we should act, what did that person think? Am I, and there's just like so many little parts of us. We're never just one thing. We change so much all the time. And I think that's a thing that really I noticed came up in my work when I was sort of creating stuff was this theme of, um, you know, just all the different facets of ourselves and talking to all these voices in our heads. And I actually ended up writing, it's so funny, I ended up writing um dissecting Gwen which is the short with all the voices and then I ended up seeing um inside out and I was yeah. like, oh gosh, this is like the same story it must have been in the ether I had this theory about um about uh creative ideas that they sort of like spin around and then you get like 12 vampire shows in one year and then you've got like but I think there's something about there's this fascination in our culture now and also a much greater respect for our mental, our mental health. And I think that it's prompted a lot of creators to like look more at that and look at our inner life and why we do the things we do. But I think as an actor, I'm also, like I always say, if I, if I didn't go into acting, I would either like redesign houses or I would be some sort of a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I, I'm really fascinated with why people do what they do. And I think the whole thing with acting is you're essentially breaking down why people do what they do and then trying to piece a story together around it. And um, so I, I think there is always, for me, a fascination. I also really like, one of the reasons I love working on Winona Earp so much um, is because I love working in the genre sphere because I don't, I'm not as interested at, in stuff that looks like my day-to-day -day life. Right. I'm really interested in magical realism. I'm interested in things that, different worlds and fantasy because I came from a theater background so I think that for me that's like what it's all about it's we're all just playing it's all pretend it's all storytelling yeah. and I think it's so cool that you can play the emotion of uh you know romance you can play romantic and then you can play like a cop or you can play a lawyer or a gunslinger or um you know anything or a monster um and i think that is one of the things that's so magical about it so i think so it's such a long-winded answer to your question but i think for me i always will want to do work that has a touch of whimsy or magic in some way right um, and i i'm really interested in the mind and in mental health and how we work and why we think the way we do and why we react to certain things and i just yeah i'm sort of well, well, no, that's that actually going back to what you said that if you were an actor, you'd either be a psychologist or you'd design houses. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about like a psychologist who designs houses. Like, how interesting would that be? You know, it's like <laughs> you, 
so like they'd have to sit down with the people who are go who want the house and have to completely analyze them first before designing their home. That's so cool and figure out what it is that they truly want and how yeah, yeah. yeah, I love I love that idea. That's a great idea. There you Maybe go. You, you never know. That might be my next my next thing. Exactly, exactly. Well, I hope I get a uh, a special thanks credit you in the uh, sure. there you go. Perfect. Right perfect. Down with the date and everything. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Now, um, of course, I'm an owner, like you brought it up, is genre. There's uh, a lot of different, of course, there's a lot of different supernatural elements and things like that. And there's a lot of times where actors who are playing one role get to play a different role. And I know we, we can't give away any spoilers or anything like that, but it feels like this season, everybody kind of gets a little chance, a little taste at playing somebody they're not. So what was it like to inhabit the skin of a different character who's inhabiting your skin per se. Mm -hmm. I think it's, oh, that's really hard. Even just the question, I'm like, how do we not spoil it? <laughs> um, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's really cool. I mean, when do you, especially in the fourth season of a show, it's so nice to get to try something different that's what this show even if it's not like we've done a lot of possession in the past with the Gooverly and um Gunona and I, I uh I, I think we've and I, I got to play Maeve last season and Doc gets to be a vampire and even when you you are a version of yourself it, it, you just always are getting these gifts to try something different and as an actor like I'm never ever for a split second ever bored on this show. I, it's always like every script, I'm so excited to read it. Every script, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to do this. Or I can't wait to try that. And, and the writing is so good. It's such a gift to be able to work on writing that is so, like our show's insane. The, the ideas of it is craziness. Yeah. But for some reason, these amazing writers are always able to bring the heart they're always, it, it's always motivated in these characters' truths. It never feels weird or impossible or like, oh, what a weird world. It's always like, yeah, this makes sense that this would actually happen and these are real people going through this. And, and I think that's what's so amazing about the show is that it's always grounded in the emotion. It's the, 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 the fuel is always there for a character. You're never having to be like, well, I guess I'll just sort of fake this one or... Um, it's always there, and I think that's a huge credit to Emily and her writing team. Oh, definitely. No, definitely. Yeah. It's some great stuff there. And, of course, you've gotten to work with a lot of, like, strong women, you know, of course, like Melly Scrifano and, and, and Emily, and then, of course, um, Catherine... Exactly. Catherine Reitman, is it Catherine Reitman of Working Moms? Oh, Catherine Reitman, yeah. Catherine Reitman, yeah. Catherine Reitman of Working Moms. Um, so from working with all these women, is there anything that you've taken on your own projects, your own directing and writing from them? Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, I think the undercurrent of just, there's something about seeing women excel at such a high level as seeing anyone, but especially women, cause you can sort of see yourself a little bit more in them. Um, you know, I've watched Catherine Reitman and my friend Tamara Duarte and Melanie Scrifano all work through pregnancies and newborn babies. Um, something which in the film industry until pretty recently was not something you could do. Like you were really looking at like, you want to give up your career for two years or do you want to, to be a mom or, do you, you know, and more and more industry is adapting to make it so people don't have to make that choice. It's definitely still like it's a it's a, a hard thing to be an actress and and have a, a baby I'm, I'm not discrediting that it still proposes a lot of challenges in this industry but I think watching women do it made me less scared to do that I think watching Catherine Reitman run her own show produce direct show run write and star in her own show I mean you just it's that like you have to see it to be it you have to see people doing these things to go oh, wow, like that, it's possible. And I think, um, I think as women, I know for me growing up, I was always sort of like apologizing for my own existence. It, it's, it's always like this idea of like, 
don't be the loudest in the room. Like don't, not that I was ever taught that, but I just think as little girls, there's something and it's changing. It really is changing now, but as little girls, there's like this whole like princess culture, which is so poisonous and silly, but there's this, um, this, there's this idea that you're like, you're, you're meant to be nice. I think there's this niceness of always be nice. Don't speak up. Don't like disturb the peace. Just go along with it. Just be nice. And I have seen time and time again, the women that I admire the most and that excel the most. They don't apologize for their presence that they take in a room. They don't apologize for, um, being strong and smart and in charge. And I think just to have that to look up to and that and to aspire to that kind of energy and to never apologize for your success um, or your talent or your ambition. Um, I think having those role models in my friends and colleagues has is, is been huge for me. I think it just um, dismantles a lot of the fear. Like when I was... A kid, I was in eighth grade and I wrote in my yearbook that I wanted to be a director and there was like no female directors at the time so I didn't see the path to how to because I didn't see the example and I, that's why I just think it's so important for like representation in our media but also behind the camera to have diversity um, people of all ethnic backgrounds people of, both, of all sexes I think it's so important and it's really such a testament to the trailblazers who were like brave enough to go i don't see anyone like me but i'm gonna i'm gonna get in there um so it's it's just been amazing to work with these women i'm so so fortunate to work on female driven shows um i don't know how it happened i just got on like three of the most feminist shows out there and i'm so grateful but i have to think too that there's a reason and that I am have a responsibility in some way, whatever way it's going to be to, to carry that torch and to inspire the next generation. So I hope, I hope that uh, I can do that because I've learned so much from these women about just unapologetically going after what you want, but also being the other thing I've really noticed um, working with women and, and men too. Like I never, I've worked with incredible men. It's, it's, but just like, just all across the board, incredible examples of amazing leadership. Um, I think we've all seen it in whatever we work in, where you have kind of the big boss at top who doesn't want to take anyone's advice and doesn't want to like show weakness by accepting someone's idea might be better than theirs. And I think what I've learned from working with amazing people uh, amazing leaders is that you put a team around you of people who are better at what they do than you are. That's why you bring them on board. Like, why would you, why would you hire someone if you think you can do it better, but to humble yourself to acknowledging that they're going to bring something to the table and being open to it and not letting your ego get in the way. That's another thing I've really, um, learned from working, especially with Emily Andress. She's, just amazing at using her team and making every department and every person on Winona Earp feel like their artistry matters, their opinion matters, their creative input matters, and that's valued. And inevitably what happens when you do that as a leader is you get way better work out of your team mm -hmm. because everyone has a stake in it. Everyone's then going, well, I can make a difference. If I, if I put my best foot forward, I'm going to con I'm going to contribute to this and I'm going to make this better. And my ideas, my time, my, my expertise are valued. Um, and you get a better product, but some, there are some leaders out there who cannot, you know, their ego just completely gets in the way of that. And I think Emily especially has been one of the most amazing examples of an incredible leader. Definitely. And I'd say as a writer, Emily knows where to put a good fuck. Ooh. And I will say sometimes yeah. it saddens me when Foley covers a bit of the, the motherfucker or the fuck, but <laughs> knowing that it's there and hearing at least part of it, that brings warmth to my heart. I that brings warmth to Good. I'm very glad. Yes. <laughs> he knows how to place a, a really good anything, but a, a, a solid fuck is also 
definitely not lost on her. Definitely not, no. Uh, now, of course, the, uh, the situation that we're in, as I mentioned, we're in a pandemic world, and of course, conventions, uh, many of which you were going to be attending, a lot of the ERP cons and stuff, have been canceled or postponed. Yeah. And uh, now the only real fan events that we have are uh, going to be online panels and one-on-one -on -one meetups. And I know you did a couple of the home cons. Yeah. And when, when this airs, it'll be around the time that you guys will be doing something for San Diego Comic Con. So what is it like the transition to the, uh, the Zoom-like panel, the virtual world? Uh, is, it, is it like, has it changed the situation? Like, I know you still get to connect with the fans, but it's in a different way. What are the yeah. advantages, the disadvantages? Well, I think the advantages are huge in a lot of ways that I'm getting to talk to people that may never, I may never have met in person otherwise. Um, people all over the world, um, some people who, were, for whatever reason it is, weren't able to attend a convention. So that's amazing because it's an opportunity that we might never else have had together. Um, to meet, to, to share space together and to spend time. And I think that's amazing. Um, I think to, I know that the conventions for myself included have been like a little bright spot in an otherwise really scary and kind of lonely situation um, because of the pandemic. And I know that a lot of people have expressed how much they were looking forward to it or how it was something that really had kept them going through maybe really just struggling you know, I mean, I remember it just being like rainy and cold for all of March and April and sitting at home and being like, I feel horrible. This is brutal. Like, when is this going to end? Nobody knows. Everyone's scared. This is really horrible. And the conventions just provided a little bit of levity and connection to know, okay, everyone's still out there. We're all going through the same thing. You know, everyone knew what was going on. There was no one that was like, it's so weird. I saw this online thing and I didn't know why. You know, everyone <laughs> knew why we were there. And then we were all kind of in the same version of the same bad situation. And just to know that people were out there and you weren't alone on this island, like suffering alone, but like everyone understood the gist of what each other, it was a very... It was a really like amazing in a positive way feeling of community and of um, like, you know, we are the world, but like we're all really connected, we're really yeah. connected. And I think we can really lose sight of that, especially in our busy lives when we're just sort of doing our thing and running from task to task. I mean, how I don't remember ever in my life having like mandated do nothing time ever. Mm. So mm. it, it's, you know, and it's provided a lot of time for reflection. It's, it's provided a lot of um, time to just, through the online conventions, connect with people in, in a different way. Uh, the negative side of doing the online conventions is that um, we don't get to see each other. And it's really, really fun to be at conventions and to have, it's just there's an energy in the room that you can't replicate on a computer and you there is an excitement and there's also a connection for friends who like live in other parts of the world and they meet up at these conventions and there, it's a safe space for a lot of people to come and be themselves and feel the connection with the community and um i really miss that i miss that the energy it's so crazy like i would be after doing six hours of zoom calls i would be way more exhausted than like a 12-hour convention day i don't know what it is it's just you don't get that same energetic give and take with people that you do in real life um but it's just going to mean that they're going to be that much sweeter when we get going i mean you don't know what you got till it's gone right so I think once we all finally get back to it, it's just going to be a really amazing feeling. Yeah, no, what you said there uh, earlier made me think that uh, I'm picturing like this person who's just completely oblivious to everything who also happens to be an erper and actually did find out about the pandemic by seeing that there was a, there, there was a convention online. <laughs> oh, online convention. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that it didn't happen to anyone, but it would be a funny story. Oh, totally. Well, uh, 
Catherine, I want to thank you for uh, talking with me. Thank you. Uh, I really look forward to seeing the uh, rest of the first half of season four of Winona. And of course, what you guys are working on now, the second half, when it all comes out. I'm really yeah. looking forward to it. Can't wait to see what happens with, uh, with Way Hot. Yeah, I know. I'm so excited for everybody to see it. It's an amazing season for a lot of reasons, and especially some really magical uh, Way Hot moments. So.